we need to integrate better in Latin America in every single sense. So this is regarding every barrier to open a new country, to launch your business, operational side. And I'm always talking about the payment space, right? I think there's so many things to, to do to better integrate providers, clients, and let all the fintech apps, let's say all the B2C side, like platforms like banks, neobanks, and wallets, to have really better features to launch for the user base, for the final users, which currently they tend to go to a physical store in Latin America and do a huge line to pay their bills and all do all their stuff. Because right now there's no confidence in the digital infrastructure around Latin America. So I think that the main purpose that we have at all fintechs in Latin America is to better build the bridge to include financially everyone to use mobile apps and fintech apps to have a better credit score and use all the features around that. There is a big chance to, to improve that. Here is the, the big opportunity to see Latin America as a whole, as a one thing that we can make a, a nice, unique, smooth uh, infrastructure for the region. Our purpose is to integrate this fragmented region uh, through one single API connection and help out to eliminate these technological barriers that you see in every country. So what we want to do is... It is a pleasure having you in the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Moni. Hello, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for this moment to speak. Hello, the pleasure is all mine. And one of the things that I love about what you're doing is we're talking about Latin America as such. Like so many people are so intrigued on what's going on with the Latin American fintech space. So <laughs> it's going to be like a really good episode. But before we for go sure. into TAPI and what is that you're doing in LATAM, this podcast is all about basically how can we build more purpose around fintech. So what's your take? How can we build more purpose? Amazing. I know to start with that question, I think that's the main goal here, right? Uh, and I think there's a lot of purpose around Latin America and also on what TAPI is doing. So let's go I start from there. So basically, I think that the first thing that comes to my mind when we talk about purpose is that we need to integrate better Latin America in every single sense. So this is regarding every barrier to open a new country, to launch your business, operational side. And I'm always talking about the payment space, right? I think there's so many things to, to do to better integrate providers, clients, and let all the fintech apps, let's say all the B2C side, like platforms like banks, neobanks, and wallets, to have really better features to launch for the user base, for the final users, which currently they tend to go to a physical store in Latin America and do a huge line to pay their bills and all do all their stuff. Because right now there's not, there's no confidence in the digital infrastructure around Latin America. So I think that the main purpose that we have at all fintechs in Latin America is to better build the bridge to include financially everyone to use mobile apps and fintech apps to have a better credit score and use all the features around that, that there, there, there is a big chance to, to improve that. And I think that's huge because in many parts of the world, let's I'm going to say Europe, Asia, we take it for granted. Even though Asia is still developing, let's say Southeast Asia, mm. I think we, there's a ton of people who are using the e-wallets. But what we're saying, it's like in LATAM, there's still a ton of opportunity to give access to financial services. As simple as that, access via your phone. For sure. You, you've been experiencing by yourself for more than seven years how the, the fintech industry is in Asia. You know how it works. And if you compare it to other regions like Latin America, the gap is immense. And maybe you, you don't think so, or yes, I don't know, but from our side, it's impressive how much things still need to be created and, and pushed to another level in Latin America. I suffered from my personal experience. That's how and why we built TAPI. We actually were the founders alongside with Tommy, with Tomas and Nicolás, my co-founders. We, lo we launched a digital wallet a couple of years ago in Argentina. It was a digital wallet, very focused on bill payments, mobile carrier top-ups, as well as other uh, features as deposits EA, through banks and, and wallets, credit card and other features. And we really experienced by ourselves that there's so much to improve on the technology side 
when providers try to help you launch all these features. And you, and also something that is very relevant is that when we consider expanding to other countries, you have to do all from scratch again, all over again. And there's so many things that you need to understand from every single country, even though we all speak the same language, it's completely like a different thing. So that's where we saw that opportunity as we suffered it from ourselves. When we later on sold our company, that's where we, we were already thinking on saying, okay, here is the, the big opportunity to see Latin America as a whole, as a one thing that we can make a, a nice, unique, smooth uh, infrastructure for the region. Yeah. And that's huge because that pain point is also existent in Southeast Asia because mm. every country you want to expand is like starting with regulatory, like vendors, like everything. It's new. So it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. So coming back to Tapi, what's your purpose? Amazing. Yes. So our purpose is to integrate this fragmented region uh, through one single API connection and help out to eliminate these technological regulatory tax barriers that you see in every country. So what we want to do is to help out every single fintech or every company that wants to become a fintech to launch K-level and perfect experience products across Latin America. In that sense, we want to help them with different features or verticals that they launch all over uh, their, their life, let's say. So this is like bill payments, mobile top-ups, cashing and cash-out solutions. Basically, we are building a, the next generation payment network which is already being selected and, and proven by big fintechs, big banks across Latin America, and not only in the fiat world, but also in the crypto world. So we are also building that gap, that, that bridge to, to integrate crypto fiat wallets across the region. I think the purpose is there to, to from ours, from our side, from the provider side, help out all the fintechs that are growing so many, so much, and there are so many to provide better experiences, better performance. These are some very sensitive products. So when you want to pay your bill, your money, you want to pay your bill and you want the, the utility bill to conciliate and to already register your payment because you don't want your home to be without light when you already pay it. So these kind of things happen and happen more often than we think, even though this seems very basic. When you see all the underneath layers that you have of infrastructure across Latin America, uh, that's where we want to tap and where we want to, to change that. That's our purpose, like building better grounds to provide better products, better infrastructure for every fintech bank across the region. Yeah. And then you can have a ton of impact because you empower other fintechs that are growing a ton. So it's, you're an enabler of others as such. 100%. That's where, where that's what's going on. And that's exactly what you're saying is a key point here. You're just looking at the numbers of Nubank across Latin America. What they're doing is crazy. Mercado Pago as well. And also all banks are trying to reshape into new banks or to a very digital ecosystem. But in just in the case of Nubank or Mercado Pago, they're doubling their numbers year by year. When you double numbers just in one year, that means that the productivity is really big. The region is still very fertile. And the other number that I want to bring up here in the discussion is, or the talk, is that still Latin America is being managed in cash. So if we are still seeing that more than 50% of the people still are moving, they are doing their day-to-day -day financial things with cash, going to a local OXO, to a local shop or whatever, this means that the financial inclusion is still in infinite to, to tap, right? And to change it. Definitely. And then you mentioned, basically, you're a second time fintech founder. Uh, what's your hypothesis as you evolved into TAPI as such? What was your hypothesis that you were like, hey, I believe these are right and we can win? Okay. I, I like that one. So my first hypothesis when we started our first company, at that moment, what we saw is that all the utility sector it was very fragmented and also was full of opportunities to, to improve conciliation, data collection, better collection as well in terms of economics. So let's say 
more than 50%, again, I will make the same example, more than 50% of people pay their bills in cash. So they go to a local shop and they pay their cash and with, they bring uh, their bill in physical and they pay it in cash. So imagine what information will tend to be received by the utility at the end of the, of the channel, of the funnel. It's very poor what they receive and the costs are super big, super, super high because it transferred with cash, times of money. So from that sense, starting with the user, having to make a huge line to pay their bill, which is something, something that is crazy that still happens and still is going on in Latin America. To the utility at the end of the funnel, where they don't know who is paying and it's very cost for, costly for them. So in that sense, it's, our, our hypothesis was here in this segment, in this industry, starting with a digital wallet, we also, we experienced by ourselves how big Revolut was increasing. My, my co-founder was living in, in the UK. He was one of the, the first 800 beta users of Revolut at the moment. He was impressed of how Revolut was expanding across UK. And we were thinking, hey, seeing that in all these sectors, that there's so much things to improve, let's start with a digital wallet, very focused on bill payments, because we know for a fact that here is a lot, there's a lot of things to improve and to do it better. So that was our first hypothesis. Let's change the utility sector by building a better bridge between the consumer side with a digital wallet, but facing in the other side to these utilities, right? That was our first hypothesis of how we built TAP, our digital wallet at the beginning. And I love that because there's a ton of pain points. So it was genuinely an idea based on the pain points that we see in the market rather than just mm. ideation. <laughs> it was genuinely, there's a pain point in the market that we need to build. Which talking about pain points, FinTech as such as an industry, it's been around roughly for 10 years or so. Yeah, you mentioned names like Nubank, Rilkel Pago, like Nubank has been around for roughly 10 years and Revolut, same. And even though as an industry, we've had a ton of impact because we have a ton of impact in customers' lives and helping them manage stress. I believe the pain point of people struggling with money has only gotten worse over the past 10 years. <laughs> if you look at statistics everywhere across the world, like people are, are under financial stress. So what do you think we need to do as an industry to have 10 times more impact in the next few years time rather than next 10 years time? Amazing. We're getting there. I think we, I'm very positive on that change. I think we, we will do it and even faster than we think. I mean, not, not because of, of DAPI, just by, by DAPI or, or the companies that are helping the infrastructure side. I think there's so many things happening right now with AI as well that really will change forever how things are managed. I think that technology is disrupting every single sector right now. And we need to understand there's really huge potential to do so many more things with less. And this is something that, that is crucial. And we need to understand that right now we can do more, many, way more things with less resources, with less capital, with less, with everything less. And, and this is because technology is disrupting the, these sectors, but even though I'm very positive on that side, I still think there's a cultural shift that still needs to go on. And it not, it, it won't happen from one day to another. It won't happen during the night, which is that physical payments, cash usage will still be a thing in Latin America for the, for many years. And we need to understand that it will be, both things will, will coexist. The digital world and the physical world will coexist for many years. And for example, we see from TAPI that we need to be a, a, a very important player as well in the physical world, because that's how we, we, we will be able, being very attained to the physical, physical world, to build that gap, that bridge, sorry, to build that bridge, to take them every user and, and make them feel more confident that the digital world is what they need, what's, what is where the things are going, right? So I think both things will, will coexist. Uh, and, and of course, one thing that happens a lot in Latin America that is very clear as well is that there's no financial education from the mini merchant pub shop that is uh, giving service at the local shop. These owners and every single people that wants to manage their day-to-day -day financials, that they need so many more education. So 
I think it's more a cultural shift, a social shift that we need to do. And the, on the technology side, it's already happening. I'm very positive on the technology side, but still Latin uh, needs to work around with so many more things than just rather technology. And I, I love your approach because usually when we think about payments, and I'm talking about digital payments, we always say, hey, how many options, payment options should I have? And we're like, as many as a customer asks for, right? Because a customer <laughs> wants options and they will pay with many. And then basically what we're saying is, at least in the context of Latam, that also means continue to have cash as an option because we need to meet customers where they are. They, it's not like overnight. It's like we meet them with cash and then little by little we introduce them to digital. Yeah, like you say, it's a... 100%. It's we need to come from our side and understand that there will be transitions going on, but we need to be, as you said, we need to be very focused on understanding their needs. And if we want just to force them to go to the digital world just in one day, it won't happen. We need to understand very well their problems, not only in terms of users, like in the individuals, but also in companies. Like if you see every single company SMB in Latin America, they still do all, all their reconciliation and, and collection management. They still do it with a single spreadsheet in Excel and managing hundreds and hundreds of debts every single month and trying to pay to receive that collection payments just by sending a WhatsApp with no automation with it's that's where we are right now. So we need to be very, also very fits on the ground, understand that the problematic is way more deep than just bringing APIs to the world. Yeah, that made I love that you bring that example because it's very visual, right? That you can exactly. see everyone WhatsApp. It's, yeah, and they have it in their mind and, and the spreadsheet as such. So let's assume that we did have the impact with the help of AI and all the tools and some sort of mindset shift education. We have 10 times more impact in five years time. How do you measure that we've had that impact? I like very much this question. I think all it needs to be tracked and that's, I like that the, the conversation is going to that side. There's many ways to, to track the impact that, that we do and of the ecosystem. From one side, from the client side, what I would say is that we need to see how client adoption, client user base as well grows uh, every single quarter. And again, if you see new bank number, Mercado Pago number, Walla numbers, every single fintech in Latin America, they are growing so, so much. And here is like the biggest take that I see, like if they grow, Tappy will grow because we are helping them move more transactions. So there will be more transactions coming in and being processed. So it's like a win situation. And they will transact more if they give to the user base better features. And that's where we want to have them, right? Right. To build better products from our side, being our, being the infrastructure provider for them. So user base adoption rate as well, because we, we need to understand that for, let's say from hundred users that use Nubank, we need to help them that at least 50% of them are, will be payable users that pay and use the platform and as well, they use it for bill payments, for example. So that's where we try to improve the adoption rate. Another thing that we try to help a lot is, uh, as I was saying before, we need to do way more with less and before Tappy was in the market. When a fintech or a bank wants to launch bill payments feature, they had to go through a process that lasts at least five to seven months. The agree commercial agreement, the, te the technical integration, post-production, you need to do so many things to, to make the workarounds to make that work. Uh, so that's something that we really track a lot is how many days or weeks it takes to our clients to integrate with Tappy. We have a very nice record right now from a startup that was in six business days. They integrate oh. the whole package of Tappy, just six single days. It's a company in Colombia and they launch everything like bill payments and mobile top-ups and gift cards as well, digital gift cards. And they work with us since a year and a half ago. So yes, I think that's something that we need to measure because from the fintech side, from the bank side, there's so many features they want to launch and the product roadmap, imagine, and, and for sure, I know at least what I'm talking about, like. They need to make all the refinements on, okay, we're going to prioritize this product or this one. Something that we need to break up their minds is that these features, these are integrations with us, 
it's nothing that will take them months. It's something really simple. And, and our goal is to think, to make them understand that just one backend developer, one frontend developer working one to two weeks with us, that, that should be fine for them. Of course, then you have some process internally from every bank or of index. But from our side, we can guarantee that integrations are smooth. And we also track a lot how much time it takes our clients to, to integrate with us. So that's the, what we basically do. And of course, then we also track a lot to, to finish the, the point is that we need to see how the, how our clients are using our products and measure this time over time. So we see like a, a single user from a client of us is paying bills. Okay. Do we see the retention cohorts? Do we see that they are still paying with us every single month or they moved away and now they're using another platform? So we need to, to help our clients. I, I don't believe that this is a, just a, a work that our clients need to do. This is a job that is done in, in collaboration with them, that we need to make them think and see by themselves that this client was paying their bills with us and now it's no longer doing it. So we need to see cohort retention cohorts together and understand why is this happening, when it's better to send uh, alerts or whatever to help them. There's a lot of, of things that we do to help them to improve this cohorts of relations. I love how you thought about that question because it's not only the, hey, we, it's the usage, but the retention, but also I love the six days <laughs> example on how long it takes to go to market because, and I love the six days based on an example because in the past, I don't know, I, I sometimes speak with vendors, right? And they've been like all sorts, partners, I like calling them partners. So I speak with partners and Sometimes it's been like, oh, it's just one line of code. It takes one day. And I'm like, it never takes one, <laughs> never one line of code. That's it. <laughs> it's no. But then when you say six and it six days and it's practical with a, with the client, that is cool. In one sprint, you can basically release a feature with what, with one backend and one mobile that I like that. Yes. Sorry. One, one more thing here, Moni, uh, is that. Something that, that I want to also to mention is we've been in their side. Like we, we worked, we used to be the client integrated with providers, with their API documentation. As we been in their side and we understand what they want, what they need. When we created our APIs as a provider, we already thought to be simple for them. It's not that we just look around the market, benchmarks. We did what we would wanted to do as a client. We, well, if I were a client, what I would want to receive and to understand from the API documentation. So that's how we thought about it and that's how we build it. So that's something very unique. It's not very common, but it's a huge comparative advantage that we have that we've been in their place and we understand all the development team when they try to integrate with us. It is because of the pain points. Yeah, so for sure. For sure. Genuinely pain points. <laughs> so yeah. 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 It is. As we transition to talk more about TAPI. We've been talking about impact and purpose, and one of the ways in which we deliver this impact is basically by creating companies, by creating products that enable fintechs or consumers to take certain actions. So what is your take on how, what, what is a great product? I love that question. Yeah, I think this is key. Uh, everyone wants to build an amazing product. I think. Again, doesn't happen uh, just overnight, but I think that some, something that is uh, non-negotiable negotiable is that the product should include everyone and should be uh, really facilitate, facilitating the experience of the user. Ways of measuring this is, for example, the NPS and retention cohorts, as I was saying before, but for sure, uh, it needs to be something that the users tend to use over time and that they are willing to pay for use, right? They are very related to product market fit. But, um, but yes, I believe that this is the key. Like you need to do something that works, that is better for them, that doesn't bring any problem. I think right now the the barriers of product ex, uh, requirements are low still in Latin America because the current infrastructure has a lot of opportunities. But I think that clients should demand more and we we are happy with that. I think that's the, the, the key. Um, they, they need to have better products and don't focus on, on refactorings and making things all over again to improve. 
but they will, they should, the product teams, our clients should just think in doing more things, not to solve existing problems or that integration debt from the past, they should focus on what's coming next. So I think that's the key of, of building good products, things that really help and that clients want to use over time. I like, I'm going to paraphrase you, <laughs> but I like that you say now in Latin America, the bar is a bit low <laughs> when it comes to great product because of the immense opportunity there is for anyone who doesn't live in Latin America or is from Latin America and wants to understand the context a little bit more. How would you describe the fintech market in Latin or this opportunity that you're talking about? Also. Huge opportunity. Yes, the bar is very low, but how I will describe it. And everyone is seeing clearly that financial inclusion will happen, but it's still very way, very far from that point. Everyone is seeing that it's still a cash economy. Uh, uh, and everyone also, I think, understands that there's a cultural shift that we need to work together to, to make this shift to digital world, but still. Not everyone has the means to achieve this because the layers beneath that are still, still very bad, very poor. So I think it's a matter of building, yes, a better product. I think on the front side, you see already unique experiences, people doing the things very well on the front side, but on the infrastructure layers, on the back end, the back end layers, that's where we are tackling the problem. That's what users don't tend to see. And that's where Tappy is doing the words to change that. So again, I think it's a huge opportunity. Everyone is seeing it. Also, if, if we talk about VC investments in Latin America, how this changed over time is increasing a lot. As we, we just raised a very big round in Latin America, a series A of almost $23 million. And it's not very common to see this in Latin America, but it's tending to see it more and more often. And it's very good for us. It's very good for the ecosystem. We really hope that our achievement will help others to bring more and more investments in Latin America. That's what we tackle and we are proud of that. Being honest, we are proud of helping more people to, to see them, to, to have some more lights and in Latin America, right? I think that's what we need more exposure. Yeah, definitely. And you should be proud of that. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> it's a big achievement, right? Like we're just saying like Latin America, when it comes to fintech infrastructure, it's still struggling. It's, that's it. It's not that Indeed. developed. And every market is different. And the need, like from consumer perspective and small businesses, the need is huge. I think, I think what people who do not live in Latin America and go to Latin America, they're feeling it's. Oh, with love in Latin America, people are, so people are so friendly and we love the food. But I think people like you, like me, people who work in fintech in Latin America, we know, yes, people are amazing, food is amazing. But we also <laughs> know, we've seen, we've lived, we've grown up with the inequalities. We've seen the, how you and I went to school, but the boy next door had a very different life. And we feel like I was lucky that I was just born in a family that was not poor, basically. And I think it's that, that feeling that may drive many founders in Latin as well. And I, it's something that is not very visible to the world. It's like, we, we see yeah. it, but we don't talk about it much. So when we talk about her, there's a big need, it's because We've really seen the need, <laughs> but, and that's why this is only yeah. important. I know your approach. I, I agree thousand percent with what you're saying, and it's just like that. That's you just describe, describe Latin America. That's what, how we are, and it's a matter of luck. And and as well, uh, we have a responsibility. I think we have a social responsibility to to help on that building that bridge. And as well, I think social and financial inclusion. Is key here. So there's no credit score. There's no, nobody has a credit score in Latin America because nobody uses digital products that can help create this history, create history from people. So that's where we need to tackle in. And I think that from our side and every single 
a player in Latin America in the fintech world, in some way or another, are helping move things to that side. And I think that's a key point. But yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. Hopefully in a couple of years, we see it again and we meet in person one day and we can talk about how things change in Latin America. Hopefully it will happen. <laughs> Um, coming back to Tapi, what specific problem statement are you solving for? Can you go deeper, deeper? Yes, we are solving the payment experience that final users right now have in Latin America to manage their day-to-day -day basic financial needs of paying their bills, paying their debts. Uh, this is an industry that is currently broken and fragmented. And we are solving the infrastructure layer to help all our clients, this is to say fintechs and banks and neobanks, to build better products for the final users. So that's where we are talking right now. We are seeing Latin America as a single region, and we want our clients to build smooth products that can be launched in one, two, three, or five countries with just minutes with just days of working and not more than that. And as, as I was saying, helping them to do more with less. We are operating in Argentina, in Colombia, in Peru, Chile, and Mexico. And in every single country, we see huge potential to help our clients and in the end, help their final users to, to build a, a better product. So I think this is our take here to build a better payment ecosystem, a better payment features and solve this, this rotten layers that we see beneath in every single rail payment rail that there is right now in Latin America. Yes. And I like that you mentioned you are in five countries, but at the beginning of the conversation, you were like, Hey, opening in every country, it's like a new challenge on its own. You have to start from scratch. So basically not only you've done this five times, but you are creating a platform that is usable, like for a customer, let's say for a, for an international neo bank, international bank, they just need to integrate with you once. And then they have presence across all the markets rather than five times. Exactly. Exactly. We, we we're trying to help everyone not go through what we've been to basically. <laughs> we've been okay. through that process and we understand how to do it, but we will try to not go through all these problems to every single client that we work with. Of course, in the B2C side, as you have use of deposits, the regulation is different and it's more complicated to open and the barriers are higher to open every single country. But from our side, when they want to build more products and launch more products in every country, that's where TAPI kicks in and it's helping them to launch them easily, right? There's one client, for example, that we launched in Mexico. And they were opening operations in Colombia, like two months later. As soon as they launched Colombia, they already been able to launch with all the features that TAPI has because they were already integrated with us, with us in Mexico. Because they integrate with our regional core, not with that country's core of TAPI. And that's something that is very nice and unique. I, I tend to, to tell this story that, you, that and it's 100% true here that happened, that is that it took more time to, to finish the legal agreement to open the, for the Colombian operations than actually launching the product in Colombia. And this is something that is crazy. It never happens. And we, I think this is very unique and nice that, that happens with us. Good. I, I can imagine that. <laughs> that is <great. laughs> Thank you, ready. <laughs> but it's, we're waiting on others. Imagine, it was just a signature thing to, to wait instead of, yeah. of doing all the product. Yes. So this is a question from the community that I absolutely love. That is, what makes TAPI an innovative fint? I think we are here on the edge of looking what's next, of what's coming up. We have a, a technology-driven mindset in the founding team, in every single person in TAPI. And we know we are in an industry where things we're always done in cash. And I think that's the key point here. Where we are innovative is that we are not seeing this as a cash economy or as a digital economy. We, are, we understand where we are right now, but we know where things are going on, where things are going. So we need to, we are the ones trying here 
to be innovative in the sense of bringing the next generation technology of payments to this industry where maybe nobody or maybe not all, every single player uh, has the, the, the recipe. I'm not saying that we have the, the amazing re uh, recipe here and we know for a fact what to do every single day, but we know where things are going on. So I think all the AI tools that we have right now to incorporate and to, to use for our infrastructure, we are already seeing huge differences and it's not easy to do it. So we're happy on that trend. I think that's where we are taking it to an next step. I think AI is, is key. And then I'm as underdeveloped as we might say that the fintech scene is in Latin. I'm assuming you have competitors because we all do. Why should I, as a fintech or a bank, choose you and not your competitors? Okay. I would say our competitor, our biggest com competitor right now is cash. I would say it's cash and the culture of, of paying things in a local mom and pop shop. I think that's our biggest competitor. But going to your question, what makes us different is that we are the only player here that sees and provides an infrastructure for LATAM as a whole in terms of bill payments, mobile top-ups, gift cards, and well, as well as cashing the shout. I think we are the only players that provide a, a really unique experience on a single API connection to help them out, go through all these uh, pay, payment experiences across the region. And then because we have some payment features and performance that are also very unique to us, uh, automatic uh, auto pay uh, experiences uh, and really unique uh, uptime performances that we do from our core that we have right now. I think that would be, and, and velocity, I think velocity integrating on working, I think that's also the differential, the differential. I, and just one more thing. Uh, this more maybe like a cultural thing, but we speak their language. I think this is not 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 small, and I think this is actually all the opposite. I think it's huge. This thing that we know how they think, we know and they want things. So we speak their language, and I'm not talking about Spanish. I'm talking about fintech, about about technology on how things want to be communicated, where they want to be to have the communication channels, how they want to do things in terms of legal contracts, in terms of technology uh, standards. So this is key point because they, any, every single client, when they are open to work with, with the providers, they want to do things easily, smooth. They don't want to, to bring in problems. They want solutions. And maybe this seems very vague, what I'm saying, but it's not because you are very sometimes focused with your product and you think, no, this is the best and this is the way it works. And you need to be flexible and understand what they really need. And I think technology has, has a, a huge protagonism on being able to be flexible and do things as the client wants and not as the provider wants. Definitely. And you've mentioned AI a few times already. What are you guys doing with AI? Okay, so several things. One that I love the most is that we create like our integration module, making like a, if you were a developer trying to integrate with Tappy, we create the, the whole array of code and how a, a backend and a frontend developer should the lines of codes to integrate with Tabby. So when a client uh, integrates and signs agreement with us, we offer uh, this integration model that they basically can copy paste. Of course, it's not, it's not just copy paste, but it's very close to copy paste. They will understand the whole things on conceptually how to integrate with us and what are the best practices to integrate with our core. The backend and frontend developers won't have to go through a very thorough process of thinking how to do this because all this model is already uh, offered to them uh, in hand. And as well, we have, and this is something very more fun, uh, that we have our own GPT basically with all our documentation and with a lot of, from our integration team, a lot of tweaks and messages on how to do things. So we offer this GPT to the backend and frontend developers. If they want to ask our GPT with, hey, how should I connect with this endpoint and do better this connection? Okay, so we already have this uh, GPT very well trained on how we want to answer this with the most common question that we usually receive from thousands of calls that we have of 
happen later days. So DKBD works a lot sometimes to give independence to our developers from the client side. Love it. It's the first time. <laughs> I but I love both that it's first, it's you've done the thinking for me. Of course, yeah. have to tweak it, but it's boom, here's done thinking for you. But I love exactly. the, the GPT because then exactly. That's the first thing that I do that it's like, hey, APIs is the other. And then eventually when the devs start working on it, they will have to talk to your devs and it takes time, right? And especially exactly. in times of differences and all that stuff. And now it's just as simple as, hey, how do we do this instant? Exactly. I love that. We <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We work with developers from China, from Uzbekistan, from Argentina, from the United States, from France. And of course, we are, we have our calls as well. It's, this is not this is thing complementary. We it's, it's like both things happen, but having this tool is very helpful for them. And the numbers speak by themselves. If you see how the usage the usage that they do is increasing, yeah, they use the tool, so it helps. Right, clearly, it helps. And yeah, that's something that those two are many examples. Then there's a lot of things in terms of our core, more more technical side that we do with our infrastructure. Maybe it's a lot of detail, but I think these two are very clear to, to illustrate what we do. Yeah. Amazing. And then you also said that you raised funds very recently. Congrats. Uh, Thank you. What's next? Oh, what's next? Uh, I like the question as well. Uh, but what's next? We'll see. I think that the main thing that we see here is that Mexico is the market that we have has the, 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 the strongest potential. We are giving more focus to Mexico. So we raise the funds mainly to, to focus on that market. Still, there's a long way to do to consolidate our businesses across the region, but we are not foreseeing for now opening new markets for now because we see a lot going on in Latin America. We will soon happily communicate new partnerships that, that will, will make a shift in, in how we are working. So I think there's still a long way to do to consolidate and night and also banks, the industry of banks still, it takes more time to, to be able to offer your value proposition to, to the banks. And we are working with a couple of them still, there's a long way to go, but yes, I think mainly it will be to focus on our business operations right now, maybe with more focus in Mexico, we don't uh, think on expanding hugely our team. I don't think things will change a lot, being honest, uh, on, that, on that side. We will tend to have the feet on the ground and do things uh, thoroughly think and talk. I'm conscious of time, but I have two questions for you. First, you. Kevin as a founder and human and two times founder failure. Can you tell us like a story about a time that you failed and basically what is it that you've learned from failure? Oh, so many failures. Uh, oh. I, need to, I, need, I need to pick one. <laughs> yeah, not the episode. And we can take the whole day thinking of failures, I think, but, um, yeah, I think so many, of course, in the, when we launched the digital wanted, when we were first time founders, we had so many mistakes that the thing important here is to learn fast from them, not, not to be in love with your, what you think is the solution. And when you start seeing that the things are not going uh, north, they are going south. You need to be flexible and cold enough to understand that this was a failure and you need to change it. I don't see the digital wallet was the, the bridge that helped us understand really in full the, the pains that were in the ecosystem. Without building the, the wallet that we built, without building TAP, we wouldn't be able to launch TAPI, the new company that actually is doing really great. Even though we sold the company and it was a, a good sell, uh, I still think that the digital wallet was not uh, an, um, a success, of course, because we, we, we sold it in the end. Uh, we underestimate the huge competition that, that was in the market. 
And there was also an economic boom and a fintech boom where the, the customer acquisition costs were, were leveled in the sky and we weren't the, like really wanting to, to validate those costs. Uh, I think in that process, we underestimated competition. Uh, but again, I think they are failures, but, but at the same time, it's learning, right? It's, it's all learning and it's more on how you take things, how you approach things. Now with Tapi, maybe another failure going to what we build now with, with Tapi, with, 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 my, with our company, maybe we were really fast in launching our new, our first country beside Argentina. So we started from Argentina and we kick, we quickly expand to Colombia without first understanding really deep the, the roots of the problem in Colombia. Of course, going faster also help us underst understand faster what ha was going on. But there were some months in the beginning where we weren't finding the, the fit that we was seeing in Argentina. And we took more time that, that we were expecting. In the end, it was a really good decision. Now it's, it's like we are having a good business in Colombia. But yes, maybe we were very anxious and, and excited on launching fast in new countries. And maybe we have to wait a little longer and be more strategic. But I think those are good examples. Perfect. And then this is my favorite question. If you were to choose one, if you were to change one thing, but only one thing in FinTech, that would have the most impact to customers, colleagues, and shareholders, what would that be? Of a... Uh, I'm thinking one thing to change. I think there's not enough collaboration between governments, banks, and the entrepreneurial world. I think there's no collaboration, really deep collaboration. We see some good things going on. There are some things going on. I, I'm just generalizing, of course because of the benefit of time, we can go through a lot here, but I do see some things, but at the same time, I don't see enough collaboration. And this in the end is actually making impossible, not impossible, but making harder to do this cultural shift, to move people to the digital world. Some companies are trying to, of course, to hold back to what they do and have their, their business as it is, but technology speaks out very loud and people is seeing the shifts in technology. And it's very clear for everyone when you use social media, when you see how things are doing it in other countries. I think Southeast Asia is an amazing example as well. I, I think people, I like all these apps that you see in Southeast Asia, in Asia as a whole as well, they, they show to the world that things are really digital and there's so much that we can learn from it as well as Revolut and other uh, companies across the, the world. But I do see in Latin America that there's still no collaboration at all. And that's something that will change. If we need to put clients, the, the people first, that will change everything. Still, this is not going on. Yeah, we need to work together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand that business is business, but that's why I think there's some stakeholders that should have more impact and more decision than others. And that's maybe where I think that governments can do more here. I think it's been such a good conversation. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. It was a really amazing, really nice chat. Thank you, Moni. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Ciao.